Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here we are uh, entering our last uh, section of the uh, nervous system unit. All right, so uh, looking at cell-to-cell -cell communication, uh, synapses are where it's at. Um, now, uh, there are uh, instances in which electrical impulses are sent from one neuron to the next, but what we're going to focus on are those uh, chemical uh, messages that get sent through neurotransmitters. So uh, neurotransmitters cross the synaptic cleft or junction uh, between neurons and stimulate uh, the subsequent neuron to fire. Now, oops, I'm sorry, let me go full screen on this. Uh, let's see, uh, the presynaptic neuron, as we've uh, looked at before, uh, actually has the neurotransmitter stored uh, in those vesicles. And uh, again, when stimulated, uh, the vesicles fuse with uh, the uh, membrane and release the neurotransmitters into that cleft. Uh, and then the neurotransmitters uh, bind with receptors on the uh, postsynaptic uh, neuron and then uh, can either be uh, excitatory uh, or inhibitory. So they can make it more likely or less likely for the next neuron to fire. So here we see uh, that synaptic terminal, uh, the vesicles fuse, neurotransmitters are released into the cleft. There are the receptors. And what they can do is open up uh, and allow ions to uh, flow uh, into the uh, membrane, making them more or less likely to uh, polarize or depolarize. Now, uh, once the neurotransmitters have been uh, served their purpose, uh, different options uh, uh, are available for what will happen next. Now, the neurotransmitter can simply diffuse out of that synaptic cleft and have no more impact uh, on the uh, nervous system. Uh, it could actually uh, be broken down by enzymes, and they also can be reabsorbed uh, back into the presynaptic neuron. And that's uh, what happens with drugs uh, like Prozac. Uh, serotonin is associated with um, feelings of uh, well-being and contentment, and uh, individuals uh, who uh, experience certain forms of depression may have a low serotonin production as a contributing factor uh, to that production. So what enzymes, or I'm sorry, what uh, drugs like Prozac do is act as uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors which means they prevent these vesicles from reforming in the presynaptic neuron. Uh, so what happens is the person produces some serotonin and it's released into this cleft, but rather, rather than being reabsorbed quickly back into the presynaptic neuron, those neurotransmitters that are produced spend more time in the cleft and are more likely to uh, create you know, excitatory uh, postsynaptic uh, potentials. Now, um, these postsynaptic potentials, the potentials that reach the uh, dendrites of the uh, postsynaptic neuron, uh, are graded. So you can have partial depolarizations that don't reach threshold. So that basically means, eh, with this potential, some of the gates are going to open. You're going to get some sodium flowing in, but not enough to cause a full-blown uh, action potential. Now, um, one, uh, a single uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential, that's what the EPSP stands for, uh, again, may not open up enough of those sodium channels to trigger uh, a full-blown uh, action potential. But um, two excitatory potentials uh, spaced closely in time may actually open up enough of those channels to uh, lead to full depolarization. So the way I imagine it is uh, if a person is setting up dominoes uh, and when another person walks up and whoosh, blows on those dominoes, well, they may begin to knock down the dominoes. Well. If the person setting them up stops that and sets them all up again, well then, you know, no big reaction has occurred. Well, if that same person is setting up the dominoes, someone comes over and whoosh, blows them over, and then again whoosh, has a second breath and blows over more dominoes, then that can have this whole whoosh, cascade of reactions occur that lead to, you know, a full-blown tumbling of all the dominoes. The same thing happens with um, temporal summation here. Here, one excitatory action potential, postsynaptic potential, I'm sorry, uh, could hit the uh, postsynaptic neuron and mm, open up some sodium channels. If you give it enough time, it'll go back to its resting potential and, oh, another stimulus, again, cause partial depolarization, but it always goes back to threshold. If you simply put those two potentials closer together in time, eh, you may start closing some of those sodium channels, but if you get a second um, excitatory potential soon enough, it opens up even more of those sodium channels and boom, you hit 
uh, the threshold and you get uh, the action potential. All right, spatial summation uh, works as well because uh, recall that dendrites, they're like branched trees, right? There are several different uh, areas of input, several different uh, den uh, dendrites or these branches where neurons can uh, send in excitatory action potentials. So um, if you have different neurons bringing in excitatory potentials to the same postsynaptic neuron and they hit at about the same time, so here we see the spatial summation, different neurons firing uh, at about the same time, uh, then that can, again, cause sufficient depolarization to create the uh, action potential in the axon hillock. All right, now how do you figure out whether or not an action potential is going to be created? Well, you basically sum the excitatory and uh, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Again, some signals are going to be inhibitory, that's the red lights there. Some are going to be excitatory and based on time and how many different signals are coming in from different areas, you can cause enough sodium channels to open to uh, lead to depolarization. All right, the neurotransmitters. Again, there are, are molecules that uh, move between uh, neurons and basically open up ion channels in the postsynaptic neuron, causing it to depolarize. Now, uh, acetylcholine, uh, basically all you need to know uh, for this is that uh, it gets the heart pumping, right? It's an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, so, you know, blood vessels will dilate, pupils will dilate, heart rate increases, blood pressure increases. So uh, acetylcholine gets you all revved up and going. Uh, let's see, the amines, okay. You have uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Again, your fight or flight gets you going. Uh, dopamine, serotonin, uh, they're associated with parts of the brain or these neurotransmitters are associated with parts of the brain. Uh, that are involved in uh, emotion, feelings of well-being, uh, so um, in regulation of uh, movement, uh, like the L-DOPA associated with uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, but uh, serotonin in particular um, is uh, sometimes linked to consumption of certain foods, uh, like the uh, uh, protein, what's it called, capsaicin, uh, found in hot peppers uh, can uh, affect serotonin production, uh, supposedly, and uh, people can have, you know, greater feelings of well-being or uh, uh, release of these endorphins um, as a result of, you know, the consumption of certain foods. Uh, let's see. Don't worry about those. The one that uh, does have a greater probability of winding up on the AP test is this uh, nitric acid. Now this is a, an interesting neurotransmitter because it's actually a gas. Now it's produced by these endothelial cells lining the blood vessels. And uh, what these uh, cells will do is produce this gas that then causes smooth muscles lining uh, the blood vessels to relax. When these muscles lining the, uh, the blood vessel relax, the blood vessel dilates. Uh, so um, this uh, gas was originally uh, used, or this uh, molecule was originally used uh, to try and uh, develop a, a blood pressure medication, uh, but uh, a side effect of this um, led to the realization that the drug could also uh, be used uh, in the Viagra and other associated drugs because of the dilation of uh, blood vessels. So your uh, book references um, the dilation of these blood vessels in nitric acid uh, in a number of chapters. So that's why I think it uh, stands a decent potential of, you know, being mentioned in the test. All right, uh, always, always, always good to just sort of walk yourself through uh, what's occurring uh, in an action potential. Again, at the resting potential, you've got the leaky potassium channel, letting potassium flow out, so it's more negative on the inside. Uh, you've got the negative uh, large molecules like DNA and proteins. Uh, and you have the sodium potassium ion pump pumping out three positive uh, sodium ions for every two positive uh, potassium ions it brings in. So at a resting state, it's negative on the inside and positive on the outside of a neuron. Now, uh, when a stimulus, an excitatory uh, postsynaptic potential reaches a neuron, that can begin to open up some uh, calcium channels. I'm not, sorry, not calcium, uh, sodium channels. And when those open, uh, the positive sodium rushes inside uh, the neuron and it begins to bring uh, the 
uh, membrane potential closer to zero. So it depolarizes, it takes, takes it away from the pole or away from the extreme. And once you hit threshold, the voltage gated channels all are, sodium channels are all thrown open. So you get this massive influx of uh, sodium ions, boom, you hit the action potential. At its peak, the uh, voltage gated uh, ion channels for sodium close, so you stop the influx of the positive uh, neurons, uh, positive ions. Uh, let's see, and then the uh, uh, potassium channels open and potassium begins to leak out. And as the potassium leaks out, again, uh, the cell uh, repolarizes or becomes more and more negative until you hit this point at the undershoot where, boom, the uh, uh, potassium channels close. Uh, and then uh, due to the uh, uh, continued permeability of uh, the ions, you get potassium uh, leaking out again, uh, and then you get back to the resting potential and you've got the you know, background leakage of potassium ions and the uh, sodium potassium ion pump continuing to work. So uh, it's a, a fascinating topic uh, looking at how just moving ions in and out of cells creates you know, electrical uh, impulses or electrical pulses that are sent down cells and cause other cells to act. And just by that process, you create the ability of your body to respond, whether it's a muscle contraction, whether it's a gland producing uh, some hormone or other you know, excretory product, uh, or even the creation of thought. You know, it's a, a remarkable example of uh, emergent properties, taking you know, cells and electricity and producing all these other responses. So um, good luck studying and let me know as you have questions. Thank you.